Well, so hopefully. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. When the um, conference organisers asked me if I'd come and speak about hydro schemes, I thought, well, I'm an applied geologist. I don't do much to do with hydro schemes. But where I am involved is when something goes wrong. And as the previous speaker and other speakers have alluded to, the characterization and parameterization of the geology for any kind of underground storage or underground uh, energy process is fundamental. So I'm going to tell you a tale about where things went wrong. This is a slide of Fort Augustus Abbey that was built in about 1890. And it's famous for a number of reasons, but the one that I want to talk about is it's here that the monks first built the, the first public hydroelectric supply in Scotland. Power from the streams, or water from the streams above the abbey was aqueducted down to this rather unassuming building, not far from the abbey, where they installed an 18 kilowatt turbine. And the uh, this provided the first power to Fort Augustus, and legend has it, if you believe the BBC website, that when the monks fired up their electric organ, which I can't imagine happened during this time, it must be a little bit later, the lights in the village dimmed. <laughs> and, but in Scotland, hydropower storage is a mature technology. It's well established, and of course it was driven by the need for cheap electricity for the production of aluminium, and the first power plant to do that was, of course, at the Falls of Foyer, just further up from Loch Ness, uh, in, in, uh, just further up Loch Ness from Fort Augustus. But it was many years later before the Scottish Hydroelectric Development Act of 1943 was instigated and led to the massive expansion of hydroelectric schemes across Scotland, many of which were built in the 50s and 60s and still survive today. And hydro storage schemes are used primarily either for generating power or in a case of for pumped hydroelectric storage as load balancing. The classic idea being that you can use excess energy from wind farms to pump water up to the upper reservoir during off-peak periods. But pumped storage schemes and hydroelectric schemes are expensive long construction times with challenging engineering uh, projects. But of course they do last a long time as you can see from the operational ones listed here, they've all been going since the 1960s and 70s. So that, but there are a number of pump PHS schemes planned with planning consent already granted for four, three in Scotland, one in Wales and a further four in Scotland uh, being proposed. But you will note that the energy capacity in gigawatt hours of these pump storage schemes is relatively small. They're short term. Compared to the most recent hydro scheme of Glendoe, which has uh, energy capacity of nearly a hundredfold compared to a traditional pump storage scheme. And as I said, with the exception of one, all of the new sites are in Scotland because hydropower storage schemes require a head. Topography, mountainous regions, most popular. They require a water reservoir, so somewhere that's got high rainfall, has got snow melt, is gonna help. And they require the extensive use of underground tunnels and chambers. That in turn requires robust geology, typically crystalline rocks, hard crystalline rocks of igneous or metamorphic parentage would be best. And this image on the right shows the distribution of some of those planned and existing power schemes in uh, the Great Glen of Scotland. The backdrop is the BGS 625K geology map, which shows the distribution of faults. <clears throat> and you can see that nearly all of the sites are loco located along or in the vicinity of the Great Glen Fault, one of the largest strike slip fault structures and major tectonic structures of the geology of Northern Scotland. Is this fault system tectonically active? Yes, this image supplied by Brian Babti, one of my colleagues, shows the distribution of historical earthquakes 
that's pre-1970 in the yellow circles, and the distribution of recorded red earthquakes since 1970 across northern Scotland. And you can see quite, there's a significant clustering along the southeast side of the Great Glen Fault, indicating if you analyse the current stress field, there's a tendency, an increased tendency for slip on these fault structures. Therefore, there must be an increased risk of collapse and concern in the engineering of any hydroelectric scheme in this area. Of course, collapses do occur in hydroelectric schemes, such as in Vietnam, China, Ethiopia, and even last year in Colombia. So what I want to do in this talk briefly is to focus on one of these sites, Glendo, here, as an example of where things went wrong and how we as geoscientists need to proactively engage with hydropower plant designers, tunneling engineers and consultants to improve the communication of our geoscience and in particular the understanding of faults and fault processes. So before I get any further in, just to clarify what kind of fault we're talking about, a strike-slip fault. It's not a simple structure as you would often see it depicted on a geological map as a single black line. More often than not, it's a much more complicated uh, feature. Typically, a site investigation would drill vertical boreholes. Trying to intersect a vertical fault would be challenging. And these vertical strike-slip faults often have complex linkages between overlapping fault strands, i.e. they comprise anastomosing braided zones of fault rock separated by what appears to be competent or strong but intensely fractured rock. This is the Glendo scheme, Fort Augustus over here in the top left. There was a dam constructed up here at 600 metres, uh, sorry, 2,500 metres um, uh, uh, topographically, capturing through a series of aqueducts a large catchment area, head race tunnel down to a turbine shed here and a tail race out into, into Loch Ness. Designed to deliver 100 megawatts at 80% valve opening, the, uh, it would be the highest pressure uh, tunnel, unlined tunnel boring machine, TBM tunnel, with 60 bar at the, at the turbine. But also has the highest head, and according to the SSE website, allows it to generate more energy per cubic metre of water than any other facility in the country. This is the geology of the site. You can see the, the line of the head race tunnel and the tail race tunnel. It crosses metamorphic rocks, that were sandstones and mudstones that have now been metamorphosed into hard crystalline semi-peelites and samites. Um, ideal geology, you might think. The rocks are, in, in turn, folded and deformed by the Caledonian orogeny and then later cut by a series of faults. And this project intersected three faults. The Stronlarid fault was exposed in the plinth of the dam, and BGS geologists were very lucky to have a look at that before it was concreted over. And the Arig shear zone, a zone of ductile deformation, was exposed in the tail race tunnel, which did cause some construction problems, but they were quickly dealt with. What they made the mistake was, was this, this fault in the middle, the Kona Glen fault, which was assumed to be a very simple structure and of, and of little concern, particularly when the TBM went through it. So the site... Construction started in 2006, and there's an example of the tunnel that was bored, five-metre diameter, Beautiful exposures of the geology. But opened by the Queen in 2009, and then, but immediately afterwards, over the next two months, reduction in pressure was noticed that finally resulted in a collapse of the tunnel, um, extending a blockage over 71 metres. Debris flowed down the tunnel to fill the rock trap in front of the turbine hole, and a sediment plume flowed out into Loch Ness. And you can just about make out the rock bolts in the crown of the tunnel were all bent as though they were made of plasticine. It was an incredible force this debris flow uh, created. So, obviously, SSE, the, the uh, client, went into dispute over why their beautiful new tunnel with a 75-year lifespan should collapse two months later. And the geological argument was a case of unforeseen ground conditions. And the defendant, the German tunneling company Hochtief, 
suggested that there must be some, because they saw nothing in the, TB, in the TBM tunnel, there must be some kind of offsetting shear that displaced the fault so they couldn't see it, and thus the TBM encountered competent strong rock, and yet just above the tunnel there was this mysterious incompetent rock. They argued for a single collapse with, uh, uh, of 8 to 10 metres in width. The pursuant counterclaim from SSE, and I was part of the expert team, was that the Cone Glen Fault was indeed present, but it was not recognised. They assumed it was all mica schist, when in fact a lot of it was actually fault rock. The contractor failed to install suitable support, multiple collapses occurred over 71 metres and resulted in a massive debris flow. But it became very apparent early on, talking to the German and Scandinavian experts who brought, tunneling experts who were brought in, that they spoke a different language to us. They repeatedly used this term kakarite, and the BGS team never heard of it. What is it? Well, it's a term, it was defined by Savonius in the late Kakir in northern Sweden in 1892, and described as basically some kind of breccia. Subsequent publications in the early 1900s said it was a microbreccia or even a protomyelinite, quite different rocks and processes to a geologist. And if you look at the glossary of geology, it describes it as a megascopically sheared and brecciated rock with fragments of original material surrounded by gliding surfaces. And this slide is taken from one of the borehole cores at uh, Glendoe, showing basically just that, fine-grained black micaceous material with fragments of original material floating within it. So there's a clear misunderstanding or under, uh, complication over what we meant by fault rock and what exactly the tunneling engineers had seen. We went to look for the evidence in the field because obviously they thought this was a simple fault. This is a zoomed in map of the um, area. There's a head race tunnel running through here. This is not a simple single fault, but multiple fault strands of which there was plenty evidence in the field for their existence. The first photograph is plate 65B, the next two are 63 and 64. So just some geology. Brecciated samite. Clear fault rock cataclasite with lenses of samite linked in it, exposed in streams. And then in the access road, beautiful new road cuts exposing nice shiny surfaces. We originally thought these rocks might be pseudotacolite, in indicating frictional melting, but in fact, we think they're probably ultracataclasite. Abundant evidence on the ground for a complex and major fault structure. Underground, the evidence was equally convincing. After the head race tunnel shown here collapsed, the first thing they did was, build, was drill a horizontal borehole some 20, 30 metres to the south of the head race tunnel to see what the tunnel had actually gone through, because obviously when the TBM had gone through, it had shot creatures, covered everything in concrete. You couldn't see anything. This uh, core was logged in detail by BGS um, and exposed a large number of faults and fault-affected rocks, such as shown here in this core. Because they were now being ultra-careful, they collected everything, so a lot of the core boxes came back as gravel. Um, and you can see that from the rock uh, quality designation 0 to 73%. Anything over 75 is good. Anything under 50% is poor. Um, it was described as a possible shear zone, six metres wide. Well, I would say it's considerably wider than that. Chlorite surfaces and mineralisation. Many other cores expose similar rocks. They called this anneal breccia. We would call it cataclasite. They called, this is clearly cataclasite. They got that one right. But it's got a it's got a TCR of 80, a total core recovery of 80. It means it's, it looks like competent rock. It looks like they're, they're going through reasonably strong rock. And amazingly, they gave it an RQD of 100, which is just, yeah, mind-boggling. Um, C is another piece of samite with some brecciated zone in front of it. Clear evidence in the core and also in the, the bypass tunnel that was subsequently constructed. And these two ones are interesting. This is from that borehole T1 I mentioned earlier. You can see a zone of dark cataclastic rock with breccia above. But if you look closely at the samites, you can see they're intensely fractured, and the fractures are all healed by carbonate. There's another example from a different core. What looked like strong, competent rock was actually intensely fractured and healed rock. And this is an example from the bypass tunnel that was built 
to get around the blockage, which was the final solution. And here we were fortunate to have meter, meter by meter logging and complete access to all the core that was, that was extracted. And here you can see a typical exposure of um, interbedded semi-pelites and some niso semi-pelites and samites, which become increasingly bound by shear planes to form lozenges, and then ultimately some black cataclastic fault rock here and again here. In between, another one of these lenses of samite completely shattered and fractured, but healed. By combining the surface evidence and this underground evidence that I've just been describing, this is the head race tunnel here. There was a collapsed void above the zone. This is the zone of blockage. This is borehole T1. This is the bypass tunnel. By combining and projecting the faults of the surface into the subsurface, we were able to start describing and characterizing the detail of this Kona Glen fault zone, which you can see in a very simplistic way is made up of a number of strands interconnecting anastomosing strands of, of fault. And in cross-section, it looks a bit like this. There's the head race tunnel running down here. There's a zone of blockage. This is the potential void or collapse area. And these are the number of different faults that have been recorded in, in numerous boreholes, surface exposures, and in the TBM uh, records. So you get a clear picture now that this fault was actually quite a complicated beast. It went to court. One of the largest civil engineering cases at the time, with a quantum of more than 120 million. It lasted from September 2015 to April 16. 73,000 documents were submitted. I gave five days of geological evidence in court on that geological, quick, rapidly run through that geological summary I've just given you. But it also included the first use, I think, of a geological 3D model to help everybody in the court understand the nature and character of the subsurface. Because you're going to ask me what happened, I'm going to tell you. We were able to demonstrate the geological rock mass conditions in the head race tunnel were well understood, both at the surface and the subsurface. There was no deviation from the expected geology. The Kona Glen fault was a complex strike-slip fault, clearly visible. And the potential hazard that the defendants were arguing for was just basically not recognized. It was all called mica schist. The ruling, the contractor, the first ruling from the commercial judge that, that uh, sat first was that the contractor was found to have exercised reasonable skill and care in the construction of the scheme. The ground conditions were worse than, worse than observed, and the support proved insufficient to prevent the collapse. But significantly, he judged that the collapse was not due to a defect that existed at takeover, i.e. when the, the contractor handed over the, the uh, tunnel and the rest of the scheme to the client. SSE, as you might imagine, were less than happy with this outcome, and so they appealed. And the appeal ruling came out in April last year. Three appeal judges produced a very complex 176-page long document that clearly argued, indeed, the loss and damage was related to a de defect that existed at takeover. That the evidence overlooked by the TBM crew and engineers, may, they may not have appreciated what they were looking at. It was complex, but they voted by a majority of two to one to allow the reclaiming motion from the SSE and to, def to refuse the, the cross appeal from the defendant. So it turned out to be in SSE's favor. So the barriers and lessons learned from this story is that civil engineering disputes and construction mistakes in the subsurface are costly and time consuming. We as geologists in the geological community need to help them get it right as much as possible. And particularly the development and routing of hydropower storage schemes in crystalline rocks requires a much better understanding by the engineering community of fault rocks and processes that form them to mitigate risk. Communication and language matters. What a geologist observes and interprets is not necessarily 
the same as the engineering geologist or a tunneling engineer. They're looking at the rock in terms of support. We're looking at the rock in terms of understanding the science and processes behind it. And so energy planning and policy for future hydropower schemes need to engage more effectively with our science experts. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Martin. Uh, time for some questions. Yep, uh, David, first question. Microphone over that side. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, David Jenkins, I used to be with BP. Um, um, what should they have done then on the original head race tunnel to prevent any form of collapse? Because I assume with the bypass tunnel that it's still operating, is that right? Yes, yes, it went back into operation in the end of 2012. What should they have done? Well, the short answer is a more comprehensive geological as assessment. No, no, I meant in engineering. In engineering terms. It's, they were told to expect class four conditions, which were the worst case conditions. So basically the engineers who had done the design of the tunnel had assumed there was a fault there. We didn't know anything about it. To rather than assume it's a simple fault, we'll err on the side of saying they should, they should, uh, they should expect class four conditions, which would have meant metal supports and, and full thick shock creating. When the TBM got there, the tunneling uh, machine got there, they decided that it wasn't anywhere near as bad as expected and didn't require any support at all. So... So there was an engineering solution, but it wasn't used. <laughs> yes, exactly, yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, thanks. Just one question and one clarification. Um, did the... Would you have seen a, uh, you know, a faster rate of penetration of the tunneling during this, during the, from the machinery, as you would in <laughs> drilling subsurface? And then you mentioned the pressure lowering. What, where do you measure this pressure? You know, you said there was an onset of lowering pressure before yeah. the collapse. How do you measure that? Or the, where the, is it? The pressure is measured at the turbine hole. Pressure the turbine. of water coming onto the turbines. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, but your first point is, is well made. The, um, would the TBM have gone faster through a 70 meter wide zone of weak rock? And you would assume that the answer would be yes. And modern TBM machines are kitted out with all sorts of sensors on the, on the front blades and immediately behind. But we were never given access to all that data. I mean, as a, a geologist, obviously I wouldn't be fit to uh, interpret it, but it was one of the questions raised, but no answer was ever provided. Because you would think there'd be a measurement of their daily movement, right? Yeah. Even if it's foot. Well, but e even as they went through that zone, they recorded yeah. rocks falling off the crown of the tunnel. They, re you know, they recorded a number of features that indicated there was something yeah. going on, but they, they just put a thin layer of shotcrete on it and moved on. Can I ask a question then? In terms of the difference between the original judgment and the appeal, <coughs> presumably no new evidence is provided. That's correct. Yeah. And is that just then that the first judge had misunderstood or failed to appreciate the expert evidence? Or what changed that three people could read it so differently? <laughs> I don't think I can answer that question because <laughs> I, I, I don't have any legal uh, expertise to to consider that, and I can't even begin to speculate mm. exactly, but I mean, obviously I would have, my argument would be from the first case that the evidence was overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. That, um, so why the judge basically came down on the case of saying both, both parties are equally to blame um, was, a, a mis was a surprise to everybody, I think, so is the judge and a relief to some. by a technical expert for the court in any way in a case like this? Um, no, 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 yeah. It's very, um, sorry, yes. Okay, can I generalize it a little bit? You alluded to some similar problems in Vietnam, China, whatever. How, how frequent would you say tunnel collapses in pumped hydro schemes? Is it 2%, 50%? How often does this happen? Well, f I, I, did, I didn't go into it. I, I mean, foyers had problems in construction. Uh, Kruachan was in the granite, it was, it was relatively straightforward. Um, Glendo had problems, they're already, 
SSE have learnt their lesson and they employed BGS to look at the two other sites, Corrie Glass and Balmacan, to do a full geological and fracture fault analysis before they put the design of the plant and the turbines and the tunnels. So, so yeah. quite, quite common, really. It's quite common, yes. But not to this extreme level, probably. No. No, as I say, I highlight this as, a, as an unusual case, but... Um, Yeah. Uh, in terms of who has the responsibility, my whole history is oil industry, so I'm very familiar with this. But um, in the case of that first judgment, you know, I might have argued that the, that the client, SSE, should have been very conscious of where the fault risks were in that track of the head race tunnel and would have been cross-checking with the contractor as to what had he done to reinforce the tunnel at the areas where, as you said, it was yeah. quite obvious that there was potential weakness. And presumably they didn't do so because they accepted the solution that the contractor provided. Yeah, because they assumed that the competency of the tunneling engineer on the machine on that day when it went through yeah. was sufficiently professional and that yeah. his judgment... This is the point. You never assume. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, John Naismith, uh, Town Rock Energy. So, very interesting sample of you know rock that's intrinsically mechanically weak. I think there's quite a few examples around the world where people are say building, you know, dams, and the pressure changes the stress in the subsurface, and that leads to, you know, fault movements for for other reasons. Can you give any comment on those and whether that is another sort of unrecognised risk where there's not enough geological input? Yeah, as part of the evidence that I had, I had to compile the reports I wrote, I assessed a number of other tunnel collapses in Europe, in Turkey and elsewhere to look at the, the level of geological knowledge that was, that was present. Um, but each tunnel collapse is got a different geology, there's some very similar ones actually to Glendo in Australia, but um, the geology is, is challenging and it, it comes down to the engineers believing that they can just engineer their way out of the problem as opposed to understanding the geological, the regional context or the context of the geology they're looking at. So it goes back to that diagram I had about fault being a simple structure as opposed to a complicated zone. Um, so I think most... I'm biased. I would say that if they had more geological input, referring back to my last slide, they would they would have a better his, a record of, um, of uh, of engineering solutions and and longevity for tunnels. Uh, John Mitchell of BGS. I'm I'm managing the technical aspect of the UK Geos project, and. Yeah, um, Previous to this, I was in the oil industry. What I am seeing, and this is, this is a comment to support the, co the contractor responsibilities, is in the oil industry, I, the contractors generally have a very good understanding of what their role is and the risks that they're expected to take on board. What I'm finding working with the UK drilling community, which are not oil field, is they have a very, very different concept about what risks they should be taking on and even what risks they should be responsible for recognising. So I, I can see the both sides of the tunnelling argument, and I can see why it went through and nobody clocked it. it it's, it's something we all need mm. to be aware of. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, just, um, thanks, Martin. Just to take it back to decarbonisation. Um, <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah, I did um, warn you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, one point that you're making is the importance of really thorough geological characterization. It doesn't matter. It might be uh, collapsed tunnels. It could be, you know, understanding how geothermal heat affects the competence of rocks or, or whatever. It, it, it can't be overstressed, the fact that you need serious geological knowledge to carry out some of this geological decarbonization. But just one point. We regularly hear that pump storage is, you know, there isn't much left in the UK. There aren't many opportunities or um, areas where it can still be done. What's your comment on that? Are, are there other techniques or methods that we could use to, to actually 
produce more punt storage so that it could be more than just, you know, peak shaving or, or, mm. saving it or digging it out of a hole when we need a lot of electricity very quickly? Well, it's either Scotland, Lake District or North Wales, and the Lake District's out for areas of natural beauty. Um, the Scottish Government had a report in 2010 that looked at the potential for expanding hydroelectric power to turn Scotland into a hydro nation. And basically, they came up with some like four gigawatts or more of power was potential. But it would need 17 new sites. So could we identify 17 new sites in Scotland that could be developed either for hydro storage or for pump storage um, and get that through the planning process with a, a huge cost of construction, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, I'm not an economist. I haven't gone anywhere near those kind of that, that kind of thinking. I just wanted to display a, you know, an issue around where geology matters. Um, but I, you know, the potential is there. But it's not it's not going to be a game changer. I think as one of the earlier speakers said, it's going to you know, it's part of the mix. But addressing those bigger issues around coal and oil are, are much are far more important.